tell you a little bit about the two authors and then I'm going to turn it over to them to talk about what inspired them um, to write this book. Um, they can talk about uh, the book, they can talk about their writing style, they can ask each other's questions. And then later we will be having um, a chat and for any of you that would like to ask our authors some questions, you can type your question in the chat. And also then the books are available on their websites and that is on the chat also. So first of all, Linda, uh, she's been, uh, she's originally from Ohio and she currently lives in Texas um, with her husband and she has lots of furry animals, big and small. And um, her books are all set, they're thrillers set in Amish country. And um, anyway, she uh, has her newest one, like I said, just came out yesterday. So her book has fallen. And look, Lisa has it too. Ooh, <laughs> I'm still it. waiting on I mine. Of course I did. <laughs> I should have had one of ours. Okay. Yes, I'm still waiting on ours. So yeah. anyway, and then we have um, Lisa Unger. This is our first time having her. We're so proud. She's down in uh, Florida and she just weathered Elsa. So we were a little hesitant whether we were going to have power to have her on. Yeah. Um, but she did not lose power and she is with us. So glad you weathered that storm and hopefully it's out of uh, harm's way and out of the Florida vicinity that you're in. Uh, Lisa also, she um, has published several books and they've been in, uh, translated in 29 language and she has sold millions of copies worldwide. Um, she's known as the master of suspense. And I know some of you may have read The Confessions of 745 and there is a lot of twists and turns in that book. So thank you for that. So um, Lisa, I think I got this off your website. You, grew, you were born in Connecticut, but grew up in the Netherlands and England and then New Jersey. And now she's in Florida. And she's there with her family and beautiful family room that you do have there with all the books in the background. Thank so, you um, <laughs> You're and one thing I did, <laughs> and one thing I did find out, um, Lisa also has a new book coming out. It, we're going to have to wait a little while. I think it's in the fall of this year. And I have a title of Last Girl Ghosted. Is that correct? That's the one. That's the right. one. So yep. anyone wanting more of Lisa, um, you can look for that to come out in the fall. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Linda. Um, and if you would like to tell us about um, your the whirlwind of your new book that just came out yesterday. And we're just anxious to have you the day after. That is that is wonderful. <laughs> so if you would like to talk about your book. Thank well, you. Well, Jody, thank you very much. Uh, Vicki Colangelo, thank you. Lisa Unger. I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, and I want to thank everybody also at the Stark County Library System. Uh, really, really miss you guys. Uh, miss my, my uh, uh, annual visit there during book tour. Uh, Fallen came out yesterday. Um, this is the, it's hard to believe, this is the 13th book in the Kate Burke Holder uh, mystery series. And uh, as most of you know, uh, Kate Burkholder uh, is a chief of police in the fictional oh. town of uh, Painters Mill, Ohio. And uh, she was born Amish, but left the, uh, uh, left the Amish way uh, when, uh, after her Rome Springer when she was 18 years old. And like most of my books, Fallen opens with, uh, with the discovery of a, of, uh, a dead body. And uh, it's a murder victim found in the, uh, in the motel, the one and only motel in Painters Mill, Ohio. And of course, Kate Burkholder being the, the chief of police is called in to investigate uh, the, the murder. And Kate soon realizes that she uh, knew this young woman. Uh, her name's Rachel Schwartz. And Kate babysat for her when, uh, when Rachel was just a kid. And so, you know, Kate knew her, Rachel was Amish. And uh, she was a, another uh, Amish who uh, left, uh, left the fold and uh, left Painter's Mill as a young woman and she hadn't been back for many years. And so that's sort of how the story, uh, how the story opens. And the book is basically sort of Kate's journey in looking at this, uh, the murder and uh, 
what led up to it and Rachel's uh, past plays a pretty big role in the investigation, so. Great. I, I love it. It was, you know, everything that you expect from a Linda Castillo book. It was smart and, and twisty and dark and just, you know, awesome. Thank you for writing such an amazing book with us. Well, thank you. And the series just keeps getting better, I think. You know, I just feel like your, I feel like your relationship to, well, I, what I always loved about Kate, you know, what I've always loved about her is how, you know, she's left the fold of this community and yet she's still like such a big part of it. And I felt like this was a really, I feel like she's kind of always been coming to this journey, like the one that she had with Rachel, where she had to really look at that within herself and like sort of see her, a reflection of herself in Rachel. And so how do you, like, how has your relationship with uh, Kate evolved over the years? I know it was, I think it was 2009, right? Sworn to Silence is the first? Yes. yes. Yeah. So how has your relationship to her evolved over the years? Well, I think probably one of the biggest things, you know, Kate Burkholder being who she is, being a chief of police of a small town, she's, she's much more courageous a woman than what than what I am. <laughs> um, probably one of the one of the things that Kate and I do have in common is that we've both grown a lot during that time. Um, you know, if you read the first book, you know that you know when Sworn to Silence started. Uh, you know, Kate was uh, she was a little rough around the edges, and she was she was one of those um, imperfect. She was a very imperfect heroine. She was. She had a very personal connection to that first case that happened, and it was a connection that really put her in the center of the investigation. And because of that connection, she knew things that she probably shouldn't have known, and she wasn't able to uh, to to say what the what the knowledge was. She wasn't able to use that to really officially help her solve the case. And, um, you know, Kate had, one of the things I love about her as a heroine is, you know, if you look at where she is now and you look at where she was in that first book, she has grown so much. Uh, you know, she met John Tomasetti uh, during the, in the course of that first investigation. He was in a very bad place. He's, he's um, a state aid agent with the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. And he had just lost his, his wife and two children uh, just uh, a couple of years before the opening of, of the book. So that's sort of part of his backstory. But, you know, they've come a long way since those early days. And, and it has been a real pleasure for me as a writer. It's been, it's been really gratifying to see them grow um, as characters. And, you know, they're in a, they're in a much better, uh, more balanced place now. Excellent. That's great. <laughs> so, Lisa, why don't you tell us a little about Confessions on a 745? Oh, yeah. So, Confessions on a 745, which is just about to come out in paperback. Um, so, when we open up um, the cover on Confessions, we meet Selena. And Selena is having a terrible, terrible day, the worst day ever. And, um, and so because of that, of course, when she gets on her commuter train home, the train sort of dies on the track and she's stalled on the track. And so um, as she's sitting there waiting for the train to start and move her back to her life, she winds up sitting next to a beautiful stranger. And this beautiful stranger strikes up a conversation with a confession. And this confession um, encourages Selena to share a secret of her own, something that she has not told anybody else in her life. And then, you know, as the train sort of comes back to life and she's moving back into her world, she's very embarrassed. She thinks, oh my gosh, why did I, you know, share this really dark part of myself with a complete stranger. And she hopes that she's never going to see the beautiful woman from the train ever again. Uh, but of course she will. So that is the, the setup for Confessions on the 745. Well, Lisa, I have to tell you, um, just the last 
um, hour or so, I have been reading Confessions on the 745. Please don't give any spoilers. I have not finished. No spoilers, anyone. But I have to tell you, so I did, I, I read last night, I read uh, this afternoon, and I, I have to read this. Um, I know you got a couple of starred reviews. Um, the first one is from Publishers Weekly, and it's so apt. <laughs> Diabolically clever. <laughs> And you also got a starred review, which, you know, which is really a pretty big deal from Booklist, provides a master class in plotting. Oh. And I have to tell you, one of that the the opener of that book is pure dynamite. Mm -hmm. And it is so smartly written. It it just absolutely, I was almost well, I was a little late for this event because I was reading and I didn't, I lost track of time. And so, you know, here I am looking for the link and all of that. And I can only blame Lisa Unger because it's really, really uh, quite a thrill to dig into this book. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. I love that you were almost late for, for our, for our event. So, and I think I remember having a similar situation when we were together the last time and I was sitting in the car outside of our event reading your book. <laughs> so it's really a kind of, it's one of the joys of being a writer is yeah. being able to then, you know, connect on stage or, you know, virtually uh, with, with writers that, you know, you really admire and, and people who you really like and over the years, like, you know, our author, the people that are, you know, we're readers and fans have become our friends and that's like such a really nice, yeah, like, really nice thing. Yeah, it really, it really is. And, you know, sometimes, you know, um, you know, I, I don't think that I'm, I'm jaded, but, you know, I just have certain things that I love, you know, like every readers, there are certain things right. and you are just so right in that groove. Uh -huh. And it, so such a pleasure I'm uh, reading your stuff. It's just such, such an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was wondering, so I know that, um, you know, we, we haven't talked about the plotter versus gardener mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> Did we get into this? Like, I'm not going to say, usually it's plotter versus pantser, but like I'm on a, I'm on a mission to eliminate that word from <laughs> from this conversation. Panster? <laughs> you know, like, as if you just kind of write your novel by the seat of your pants, you know, mm -hmm. so, right, which is, like, not really, you know, it's really not, it's not an accident that, you know, we've written, like, 20 novels or whatever. Like, <laughs> we just, like, accidentally get to it. But, like, do you, so what is your process? Are you a plotter or are you a gardener? I'm a plotter. You are. Uh, I am a plotter. I like to know I, I, I absolutely know the bare bones of what's going to happen. I have to know that. I get all of that figured out before I even start writing the book. You know, sometimes organic things happen and you, you, you know, you, you basically come up with a better idea as you're writing and you realize, you know, this would be a better, a better thing to have happen in the book. It makes more sense or it fits the character in a better way, but I am definitely a plotter. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I suspect you are too. I am not. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely not. Like, I literally, all I have is like, you know, I have this like sort of seed or this germ of an idea. It usually leads me to this like swath of research. And then as I'm researching, the, be the best way I can say it is if it connects with something larger that's going on um, within me, then I start to hear a voice. I start to hear a character voice. Um, in the case of Confessions on the 745, it was Pearl. Even though it's Selena's story in many ways, she was uh -huh. the first person that brought me into the, she was the first person that brought me into the book. Right. And then I follow the voice or voices through the narrative. And I, you know, I sit down to write every day. I have like kind of a loose sort of feeling, like a vibe, what I think I'm, going for, um, yeah. but like I kind of show up day to day and I have no idea who's going to turn up or what they're going to do. And I definitely don't know how the book is going to end because if I knew, then I wouldn't be able to write it because I yeah. write for the same reason that I read. Yes. I know what's, go what's going to happen to these people who are living in my head. And yeah. I have written every book that way. I, I always think maybe I should like go, you know, like okay, this time I'm going to, I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to plot it out every chapter. I'm just going to, I'm going to set a framework, but I never do it. And I don't know if I even can. 
No, I think whatever you're doing, you're, it is right for you. Right. Because it is absolutely working. I am so intrigued. Um, so what did you call the, the pan? It's, they're not pansters anymore. They're called, what are I'm they called? calling them now? I'm calling them gardeners. So it's more like, and this is not an original idea. This is something that George R.R. R. Martin started calling it oh. because that's how he writes, yeah. which okay. is even more amazing. If you think about like the epic scope of, of, of the books and his work, but it's yeah. almost like, you know, you have a seed, you plant it, the thing starts to grow, you know, you water it, you prune it, you like sort of weed the pot, et cetera. So I think that's a, maybe a more an, an apt analogy than like, because you kind of do know what the story is. You do know where it's going to go. It's just that you, it takes, you have to, you have to get yourself there on the page. You have to get yourself yeah. on the page. Yeah. I think that would be also a very, it, it would be, you know, writing the book, you know, there's no doubt, of course, writing, writing is, is hard. It's not, yeah. it's not an easy thing. It's, yeah. you know, sometimes it's fun. It's not always fun, but I always think about that kind of writing being kind of an, a, um, you know, you know, not by the seat of your pants because you, you pretty much, you know, like you said, you know, it's like your subconscious knows the story better. Yes. Than and it's kind of an exciting way to write because some days when you sit down, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm, yeah. You just don't. I mean, and sometimes like, you know, and sometimes even when intellectually, like I'm, I'm thinking about the book, like I'm in, I'm in the middle of it. And so like, I have a, you know, an intellectual moment where I'm actually going, okay, so what's going to happen? How is it going to happen? I, and, and I, there's nothing there. Like I don't, I can't answer those questions. Like until I, and so until I'm at the page or until I hear that voice, I hear that next thing or I see that next moment, then I just, there's no intellectual way for me to get there. Like it's almost like two different parts of the brain. Like the brain that I go to, to do my editorial work to make sure everything all works and the intellectual part that has a craft that I've honed is different than the storytelling brain, which I think is closer to my dream brain than, yeah. Anything. yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's a good thing. I, I'm really, really intrigued because it does differ quite dramatically from a plotter. And I think, you know, we have things that we can learn from each other for sure. Yeah. I would sure. love to, you know, it almost sounds like that's a little bit more organic and it just kind of, you know, if you can get yourself into the right spot and you can just, you know, get that, that coming. And that, that kind of brings me to my, my next question. Um, you know, I hear this a lot, you know, inspiration for a book, but I think this, this, that question is even more important. Your book, how, what was your inspiration? How did you sort of come up with that idea? Well, I had like this sort of thought kicking around my head for a while and I'm not even sure where it came from but it was this sentence it said it was a, you cannot con an honest man and so I had this idea kicking around my brain for a while and I was like well you know it has like the ring of truth um but it uh you know nothing in human psychology is ever so simple and so I, you know, sort of started doing some research and I wound up bringing it up on a panel. I was on a crime fiction panel at BEA with Megan Abbott and Ruth oh, Ware, yeah. among other people. And I brought it up in the green room because I just wanted to see what people, how people were going to react to that. And Megan Abbott was like, oh, I don't know, that kind of sounds like victim blaming to me. And I was like, yeah, I hear that, that, you know, that, that makes a kind of sense too. And so I kind of got deeper into my research and I wound up coming across this um, book called the, uh, the Confidence Game by Maria Konnikova, who's like a, a really, really great writer or journalist. She, her most recent book is, um, is The Biggest Bluff about how she turns her, turned herself into a professional poker player. Which is a really also really excellent book, but the, her book about um, con, uh, the confidence game was like a deep dive into con con artist profiles and um, like the psychology of the the con artist and the con as well as like common scams and stuff like that. And so I came away from this book with a much more layered idea, and is that you can't con somebody who doesn't want something, but everybody wants something. So everybody's vulnerable to a good con. 
And so that was really, that was really the major like sort of inspiration. Also it was like a little bit inspired as well by Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith, which mm-hmm. is, you know, yeah. really nothing about the book that's, you know, that sort of harkens back to that, except for that like really exciting moment of like two people, two strangers meeting, you know, you know, in a like a seemingly random way and what the energy is there in that liminal space and how it kind of sort of, you know, spirals out from there. Right. Now, you know, books, you know, people are always trying to categorize books and, you know, um, you know, I read a lot of reviews and, uh, you know, uh, uh, about your book. And do you think, you know, a lot of people have called it a psychological thriller. Do you agree with that? Do you think that's, that's what it would be, you know, most closely categorized as? Um, I, yeah, I, I always have trouble with those categories, you know, even to the degree where people ask me, what kind of books do you write? I'm always like, I don't really know. Maybe you should read it and (laughs) tell me what you think. (laughs) I think that, you know, there is, it's definitely a thriller. It's probably, I guess it's a psychological thriller in that I sort of, you know, I always sort of consider myself to be a spelunker, you know, I'm like shimmying into the dark spaces of the human mm-hmm. psyche to see what's there. And, um, you know, that, so that's kind of what I do and what I've always done. But I think that psychological suspense is probably as close as you could get to, to what I'm doing. But how, what do you think? Like, how do you feel that you're like, when you think about your work, do you think of it as mystery or thriller or crime fiction? How do you, how do you view the whole category thing? Well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a long running series. This, this uh, Fallen is the 13th book in the series. And, you know, sort of along those same lines, one of the things that I always um, try to do, and I think everybody who writes a series tries to do is, you know, you really want to be able to keep it fresh. Yeah. And I think in order to do that, I think even though you're writing a series, I think it's okay to vary the kind of story. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, you know, you don't want to change it completely because I think when a reader picks up a Kate Brookholder book, you know, they have certain expectations. And as a writer, I want to meet those expectations and I want to exceed those expectations. But that said, um, you know, and it was an, it was actually a very astute um, uh, fan, a reader who emailed me and we, you know, had a conversation about the previous book, Outsider. Mm. And she pointed out that, you know, it wasn't a mystery. You know, most of the Kate Brookholder books are, you know, I would call them murder mysteries. Yeah. Outsider was a thriller because we yeah. knew we knew who the villain was I see. and you know when you look at a thriller you know to me that's more about uh the danger aspect you know it's coming uh you don't know when it's coming you don't know exactly how it's going to happen but but it's but it's going to it's going to get you and with a mystery uh you have a lot of different um you know red herrings and you have different leads that you really have to go through and unravel and fallen um, is more of a mystery. It's more of a murder mystery. And um, I think one of the things that makes it, you know, a little bit more interesting is, uh, you know, the background of the victim. We know a lot about this victim. One of the things that um, I wanted to do with this victim was aside from make this making this case a little bit more personal you know, for Kate Burkholder, you know, there are some parallels between Rachel Schwartz and Kate Burkholder. You know, they both left the Amish way. Uh, Both of them were, you know, not problem, you know, teenagers, but, but I mean, they were to a, to a degree. Doesn't Um, doesn't Kate say she was the only person who I knew who was as bad at being Amish as I was? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, Rachel, the victim was, was, you know, she wasn't always a good person. I mean, I sort of took her a step further and I wanted Kate to be able to look at this and think, you know, she wasn't always a good, a good person, but 
she didn't deserve what happened to her. So I wanted to take the reader through this, uh, you know, this woman's past just a little bit, delve a little bit into her past. And, you know, um, I think because, you know, even though she was a very imperfect person, she didn't deserve it. And I think Kate feels that parallel. And that's one of the reasons why she was so driven to, you know, try to find justice for this young woman. Right, because that's such a, I mean, that's such a, a, a frightening thing, you know, like as a, as a person, as a young person to break away from your community. I mean, like sort of on a, on a primal level, it's like the most terrifying thing that you can do, right? I mean, yeah. like to, to move away from your community and to be rejected by them because you, because you've done that. And so, you know, it must be for Kate, you know, even though, you know, she, she's evolved and changed and probably still carrying that, like sort of feeling that like, you know, that there's something maybe wrong with her because she could not be, you know, what she was sort of born to be or what her family wanted her to be. Yeah. And so in that journey with, with Rachel, you know, she's sort of maybe find a way to just, you know, honor herself a little bit more. Yeah. And, you know, um, a lot of people are sort of under the impression that, you know, when, you know, in the Amish community, the, um, the ban or excommunication is, is punishment, but, you know, and looking deeper at, you know, you know, reading about the Anabaptists and the Anabaptists that practice excommunication in the ban, it's mm-hmm. actually supposed to be a redemptive thing, right? You know, it's supposed to be designed at, to bring them back into the fold. Yes. And you know, that Kate didn't go back and that Rachel didn't go back, you know, that's sort of another thing that, that ties them. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and I think for the Amish in particular, one of the things that makes, you know, excommunication in the band so, so difficult is that, you know, you know, most families are tight knit, you know, some aren't most, most families are pretty tight knit. But I think for the Amish, I think that they are even more um, tightly knit than most, um, you know, than most English families. Mm -hmm. And I think when they are, you know, one of those family members is sort of cast aside and, you know, doing something wrong and they're cut off because they need to change their behavior, Mm -hmm. I think they're really, really lost. And they can do one of two things. They can either go farther and go on their own way, or they can come back. Mm -hmm. And both Rachel and Kate, um, you know, left. And I think that that said something profound about both of those women yeah, yeah, for sure, definitely. I'm, I'm, and I'm sure you probably, probably, I know you talk to this group a lot, but maybe for anybody who's just tuning in for the first time to to hear about Kate and the books, like, how did you first get involved um, with this idea? That is, that's such an interesting story. You know, Lisa, I'm originally from Ohio. I'm from farm country in the western part of the state. Um, the Stark County Library, you guys are sort of in the, in the northeastern part of the state, um, closer to Amish country, which is uh, Holmes County. Mm-hmm. Holmes County um, is nearly, um, I've read conflicting uh, statements about the Amish population. Uh, some people believe that Holmes County has the largest Amish population in the world, and some people say that Lancaster County but, um, you know, Lisa, I don't know if you know this about me, but I began my career writing romance. Yeah, uh, I think I do know that about you. I wrote, I wrote for two different publishing houses um, over a period of, of several years and several books. And, um, you know, so I had two, uh, two editors and I realized that, you know, I was getting a very, you know, you turn the book in, your manuscript, yeah. and I was getting a very common theme back from my editors. And they were both, both basically telling me, Linda, these are romance novels. You need to really concentrate on the relationship between the hero and the heroine. And at that point, I pretty much realized that um, I'm killing too many people. I need to stop, you know, I realized at that point that I was basically writing the wrong genre. Right. And I really wanted to write a breakout book. I wanted to write suspense. I wanted to write mystery. I wanted to write a thriller. And so I basically, at that point, I started writing Born to Silence, uh, I mean, Sworn to Silence, and, you know, I was working on it. And in the course of working on this book, you know, I was able to come up with a pretty good plot and in some loose characters, 
I took a trip to Fredericktown, Ohio, which is uh, probably um, north, uh, probably northeast of where Stark County is. And uh, I was with my brother-in-law and it's a very, uh, you know, have, they have a big Amish population in that town. And, uh, you know, traveled there, had a, you know, a fun time with the family. We're getting ready to leave. It's like 10 below zero and there's 10 inches of snow on the ground. I'm standing there in the front yard. We're saying our goodbyes. And I hear the clip clop of shod hooves coming down the road. And I turned and I looked and I saw an Amish buggy coming down the road. And, you know, the black clad uh, man with the flat brimmed hat, his family was in the back. And in that moment, um, I knew that this thing that I had been missing from this breakout book that I had been working on, if I were to take this book and, and, you know, have that, that juxtaposition of this bucolic, um, you know, Amish countryside, and then the introduction of something evil, like, you know, the, the murder mystery that I had in mind, I thought it would be a winning combination. And so that was really the point when I decided to, you know, that's basically when Kate Burkholder was born. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. I love that. It was a moment. It was kind of an, an enlightening moment. And, you know, I basically went home and I went to work on, on Kate. I knew I wanted her to be, you know, formally Amish. And I, one of the things that I loved about that is that she would be able to give us a, a glimpse into both worlds. Um, you know, the English world is a, a law enforcement and then the Amish world because she was born Amish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I loved about, about her is that, you know, because she left the Amish, she didn't really fit into either world. And I think the one world that she does fit into and that she's comfortable in is, you know, her crew, her, her officers in Painter's Mill. Right. And um, so that's sort of, sort of how she began. And there, there was a movie, right? There, there was with Nev. There was, yes. Nev Campbell, right? Yes. Nev Campbell, yeah. and you, he was that. Lisa, I have to tell you, that was so exciting. Uh, yeah. We sold the rights. Um, I think this has been back in 2013. Uh, they retitled "Sworn to Silence" to an Amish murder, and yeah. Nev Campbell was Kate Burkholder. Noam Jenkins was a John Tomasetti, her love interest. And they filmed up in um, up in Toronto, and uh, they they really did a pretty good job. It was actually a lifetime two hour movie. Yeah, and they really did a they really did a great job with it. Yeah, they did. Was it and, part of that? Was it part of that Monday mystery series that they were doing? Oh, maybe that was maybe that was TNT that was doing that. That, that may have been TNT. I don't think it was part of that. At one point, they were thinking, do you, do you remember the Jesse Stone series based on the Robert Parker uh, yeah. books? Yes. The Tom Selleck was Jesse Stone. Right. And they did um, something, it was a series, but they did a two-hour movie every four, uh, every four months. Okay. And that, that was sort of the plan that they had uh, for that. But of course, then Kate... Uh, uh, Nev Campbell goes and gets pregnant. What? And she didn't want to do the series, so you know it kind of went out the window at that point. <laughs> yeah, because I remember. So one of the one of the closest um, uh, the closest I got for, to, uh, to to film was I think I think it was I think it was TNT that they had those Monday night mystery movies oh. that they were doing. Yeah, and a bunch of them got green. Got I was were greenlit and went into production, and then I was like in the next group that was supposed to get greenlit, and then the initial group did not do well, and so there was no next group of films to get greenlit. Which, which book was that, by the way? That was fragile. Oh yeah, that yeah. was, fragile. was, that was the, the first book that's set in the Hollows, which is my yeah. my fictional town. Yes, I remember that well. Yeah, so that that was the one that was up that was up next to be developed, and then it just didn't happen. Which you know, I mean, that's kind of par for the par for the course, you know. Yeah, you know, and then some, you know, sometimes things just uh, for whatever reason, bad timing, you know, whatever. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, you never know what's going to happen in the future, though, right? 
You never do. You well, never do. Well, let us know when you sign on the dotted line, right? I certainly will. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll be shouting it from the rooftops. Okay. We'll be waiting too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, Jody, I feel like we, we haven't been we haven't been including you in the conversation. How are you? Oh, you you two are doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> you can grab Vicky too at any time. <laughs> um one of the questions, um some some questions are coming up in the chat. I did have one that's not in the chat, but I got it somehow. Um it's for you, Lisa. Um, oh. It was one of the book club members oh, uh, when we had read your book and she um, loved Confessions on the 745. Mm -hmm. And she would like to know what other book that you have written that would make a good book discussion. Oh, and I think God. that's from Kathy. Um, what would be the next book I would suggest for a book discussion? I'm, I'm trying to think, I guess, you know, probably if I were going to pick a book for book discussion, it would be The Red Hunter. Not that I can ever choose any of my <laughs> chances, Blackout. Um, yeah, there's a lot to discuss in Blackout, but Red, Red Hunter is a is a good book. I think is a really good book um, club book because there's a lot of layers to it, a lot of different personalities in it. And I think there's like a really nice um, readers group guide in the uh, trade paperback edition of the of the Red Hunter. So okay, um, I have another question for you since we're on that line of asking a question, um, and this came up in book discussion too. We had one of the members ask, um, and I'm not sure if this was your vibe that you wanted to portray for readers, but they saw some human trafficking um, underlined in Confessions of 745. Hmm. The, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. They, um, the human, they thought that the con artist hmm. um, taking these young girls was sort of on the lines of human trafficking. Like evocative of human trafficking. Yeah, I mean, it, right. certainly wasn't, it certainly wasn't anything that I had sort of set out to kind of address or, or to deal with, you know, this, like as I, as I recently discussed, you know, like these things just the, you know, the stories just kind of evolve on the page, but I can definitely see where it would evoke that, that vibe or that feeling. Um, okay. Yeah, but it's not, it was not intentional to address that as a, as a topic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. That will answer one of the person's question in book club. Um, I guess we have another question. Uh, there was one on here, and I think you probably answered it. I know, Linda, you did. I don't know about you, Lisa. And we sort of alluded to it at the last uh, conversation that you, you had. Is your book going to be made into a movie? So any other ones on the me. horizon? That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, someone else. Definitely yeah, it was somebody else, I, but it was early on. So before um, we talked about um, Sworn to Silence. Um, yeah, there are definitely some exciting things happening at the moment, but nothing that, unfortunately, nothing that I can talk about yet, but I will definitely be um, keeping everybody posted in social media and in my newsletter and all of that. So I do get that a question that question a lot, especially for confessions. Um, so just sort of fingers crossed and, you know, yeah. we, uh, we'll, we'll see how we progress. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jody, I should tell you also that we are in negotiation right now and it's, it's only for an option mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I don't really know anything about it yet, but <laughs> we never know. They never tell us anything. I know. We, we <laughs> never, we never know. We, we're like the last ones to know as a yeah. matter of Exactly. When you like reach out and you're like, oh, what's happening? They're like, don't worry about it. You're like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'll, I'll let everybody know. I mean, nothing is signed yet, but you know, once we sign, then, you know, then we can, you know, hopefully go to the next step. Exactly. Jody, can you see that there's two other questions in the Q and A part? Oh, let's see here. Because if not, I can read them. Oh. Can we click Okay, on? go ahead, go ahead, because I must uh, I must not be able to see them. Okay, it says hello. I'd like to ask Linda what kind of feedback she gets from the Amish community when she is doing research for her book. That's one. Okay. Um that that is a really, really good question. And uh, I have a 
great answer. Um, the very first, uh, it was my very first library event. I think I, the first book that I went on tour with was actually the second book in the series, Pray for Silence. And I went to, I don't know if I, I don't think I saw you guys that year. I, I went to the Dover Library uh, down in Dover, Ohio, and there was an Amish gentleman at the, uh, at the event. And the library director, Jim Gill, comes up to me and he says, oh, well, when you finish here, uh, that Amish uh, gentleman would like to speak with you. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, I'm, you know, I'm nervous anyway. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, he's going to give me an earful, you know, because there's there's a certain level of violence in the books and there's some language. And I thought, you know, we'll see. So uh, it was so funny because they did a book giveaway and the Amish guy won the book. So I'm thinking to myself, that's going to soften him up just a little bit. So after I did my spiel, I went back and I talked to him and he loved the book. He absolutely loved the book. We ended up going over uh, one of the librarians and me and the Amish gentleman rode in a van and went over to uh, Behold, the Amish and Mennonite Heritage Center and spent the afternoon there. And I got a really uh, amazing lesson on the history of the Anabaptists. So that was a very, very positive uh, uh, event. And I can tell you that I did get another, uh, a letter from a gentleman, an Amish gentleman in Indiana by the name of Levi, uh, sort of a, a letter written in pencil. He had read the third book in the series, which was Breaking Silence. And he said he hated the book so much that he, he burned it. Okay. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, you know, you could have at least donated it to a library. Yeah, or really. I mean, you don't have to set it on fire. You know, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he set it on fire. So, you wow. know, it runs the game. And I think everybody has different reading tastes and they have different expectations when they pick up a book. So, you know, that's probably my best and probably my worst uh, experience with, uh, with an Amish uh, reader. <laughs> this question kind of goes along with that. It says the Amish community is very private. How have you been able to build connections with people in Holmes County to do research? And how do you find a balance of writing a fictional novel while portray portraying the community accurately? That is a really good, thoughtful question. I it and um, I would have to say, you know, when I first started going on tour and and I didn't really know anybody, that wasn't as productive. And I have to tell you, it was a librarian friend of mine who she's sort of a social butterfly. She lives in a, in a very Amish area and she knows a lot of her Amish neighbors. And she introduced me to two Amish families. And um, I went, uh, one was a dairy farm and I got to go, I went to dinner and it was such an interesting, it was the whole family. It was a big family and it was a very typical Amish dinner. And it was absolutely fascinating for me as a writer because I had been wondering about what that is like. You know, what is dinner, dinner conversation? What is the before meal prayer, the after meal prayer? You know, is it silent? I mean, all of this stuff. And the other Amish family uh, that I, I uh, got to visit, uh, we just basically went onto the back, back porch and we had cookies and iced tea and coffee and stuff like that. He knows that I have horses and he asked me if I would like to take a ride in the buggy. And I, was, I must have been grinning like an idiot because I was like, yes, I would absolutely love to. So he harnessed up his, his uh, buggy horse and I got into the buggy and we took that thing down the road. And I'm sure I was still grinning like an idiot because, you know, we're halfway down the road and he asked me if I wanted to drive the buggy. And I said, I would absolutely love to. <laughs> and of course it was a quiet country road, but I can tell you that it's, it's always a little unsettling. You know, you're holding the lines and, you know, there's oncoming traffic. And I know, I know horses, I have, I have two horses and I know that you know, things happen, things can happen. And so it was, it was really a good experience that, um, you know, in terms of research was just absolutely helpful. And that was, that was actually right before I wrote Her Last Breath. And if, you know, you probably don't remember, but in, in the opener of Her Last Breath, I write of um, a buggy accident, a buggy, a buggy, an automobile 
um, accident. That's, that's a very bad scene. So, you know, kind of got my, my imagination going. And so good, good experience. Since then I've had, um, I've had lunch with a gentleman, uh, along with my librarian friend. And he is a, he's a reader, loves to read. He has all sorts of interesting ideas. And, uh, you know, the book that I'm working on right now, which is a summer 2022 book, was born from the conversation that we had at that lunch. So, you know, those guys, whether they realize it or not, the, the Amish families, the people that I've met were, have been just tremendously helpful. Linda, can you see the question in the chat box? I can try clicking on it. I do not see it. If a not, I can read it to you. Sure. It says, Linda, it seems your last story ended with one character still in the hospital. How did it end? Um, did I have to read this book? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember which. Who's <laughs> in the hospital? I don't know. <laughs> Please, somebody in the hospital? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He's still there. We've forgotten all about it. <laughs> One of those loose ends I didn't tie up. Was that Did Alex? You him there? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it's not Kate and Tomasetti. Uh, if, if she could send, she or he could send a follow-up on that. Um, I'm kind of wondering which book, if it was Outsider or if it, if it was Fallen. Um, I think it must have been Outsider. Uh, last year's book, I would I would sure answer that as best I can, but I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank at the moment. I'm sorry. We probably can't answer it anyway because it would be a spoiler, right? So oh like, maybe you have to go <laughs> back. Susan, are you still go on? Go back and read it again. <laughs> Susan, if you're still on, if you could add to your question, maybe she could sure. answer it for you. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Well, we'll wait a minute and see what happens. Okay, that sounds good. That's all the questions that I, oh wait. Oh, wait, it just flipped. Uh, let's see. I just want to mention to Linda that it's really cool for her readers when she mentions other Ohio communities and towns. It makes a great connection and keeps us motivated for the next book. Oh, that's, that's fabulous. It's always, uh, you know, thank goodness uh, for uh, Google and Street View. I do spend a lot of time in Ohio, even when I'm not there. Uh, and I have to say, it is very much a treat to be able to travel there every summer. I really- She said, really... the girl who was hurt and put into the hospital. What book was it, Susan? Do you remember? Maybe maybe she could email you and you can answer yeah. it. Yeah. Sure. You're really That's good at answering her. on Facebook and stuff too. <laughs> yes, when we finish up, I'll check email. So absolutely email me and I will answer that question for you, Susan. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, you know. do we have any more questions? Remember everybody we put into the hospital. I mean, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I don't see any more questions. Do you, no, Vicky? I think that's it. Well, we would love to sit and chat with you ladies and have wine with you, but yes. our time has come to an end. Um, the library does close at seven and we need to shut everything down. But um, this has been wonderful. Um, this has been months in planning. And um, Lisa, I'm glad you got to be with us. And I'm so glad. Thank you for inviting me. And it's just a joy to be with Linda anytime and any, either in person or virtually. And I'm hoping we can be on stage together somewhere really soon. Right. Thank you, Lisa. Great. So everyone look for um, Lisa's book. It's going to be out in paperback next week. Confessions on the 745. Amazing, amazing book amazing book and she has another one that will be out in the fall of 2021 That's and Linda it's so been sweet. wonderful having you here again we we truly wish you were in person Vicki and I love taking you to dinner um, uh -huh. and exploring Stark County's restaurants yes. um, again Linda's book came out yesterday the title was Fallen and it's a uh, third number 13 in the Kate Burkholder series. And you can check those books on their website. So we'll give you links for purchasing. And um, again, thanks, thanks a lot. And you guys have a wonderful summer and yeah. keep writing. Okay. And don't, and don't forget you can read those books at your local library too. <laughs>